morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this session uh, of the Q&A following the three lectures this morning. Um, I'd like to introduce our speakers and myself. My name is uh, Jay Radhakrishnan, and I'm a professor of medicine at Columbia University in New York, and I'm also the clinical chief of nephrology there. Um, Dr. Ravi Tadani um, is uh, the chief uh, academic officer at the Mass General Brigham System in Boston. He's also a professor of medicine and an academic dean at the Harvard Medical School. Dr. Fred Fickelstein is a clinical professor of medicine at Yale University. And to round up our list of speakers, Dr. Abir Levin is a professor of medicine and the head of nephrology at the University of British Columbia in Canada. So welcome everybody. And a big welcome to you, the audience members. And please do feel free to write your questions in the chat and we can look this up and present your questions to the speakers and hopefully we'll, this will make for a very lively session. So I can launch the first question to Dr. Finkelstein. Uh, Dr. Finkelstein, your talk on, on peritoneal dialysis and how uh, we cannot use a one size fits all model um, is, is really very, very important for, for us in clinical practice. So the question to you is, um, is, is about depression. And I, I've always felt a little uncomfortable handling depression in, in PD patients. So do you have a formal method of uh, assessing depression and especially uh, using therapies to treat these patients? So it's a very good question. As I'm sure um, most people know, depression is very prevalent in patients with end-stage kidney disease and chronic kidney disease as well. Most studies show that 25 to 30% of patients on dialysis have a depressive illness. That is, they can be screened with questionnaires for depression, their scores will be high, but then when interviewed, we'll have a diagnosis of clinical depression. Clinical depression has been associated with high mortality rates and high peritonitis rates in patients on peritoneal dialysis. The treatment of depression, though, is challenging. Um, medications may be associated with side effects, um, but medications can be used and they can alleviate depressive symptoms. Cognitive behavioral therapy, um, which can be used easily and obviously has no side effects and can benefit patients, can improve depressive symptoms as well. <clears throat> and simply talking to patients and addressing their concerns can help manage depressive symptoms. The challenge is screening for depression. So depressive symptoms wax and wane over time. In the United States now, we're mandated to screen for depression once a year, which really doesn't make much sense because depressive symptoms are going to come and go depending upon the circumstances of the individual patient. So building in screening for depression on an ongoing basis is critically important. So that can be done with either with questionnaires. One can screen, for example, with a patient health questionnaire too. If the score is a little bit elevated, they can complete a patient health questionnaire nine, which can give a, a good um, index of whether a patient really has significant depressive symptoms or not. Um, so I, I think building in more frequent screening for depression is important and building in treatment algorithms into the routine care of patients is critically important and should be done routinely. No different than measuring KTV and no different than measuring hemoglobin levels. Thank you. I think that uh, really uh, crystallizes the issue that, uh, you know, so-called fatigue may be just, uh, just hiding depression and, and KTOV is not going to fix the problem, getting better clearance. Thank you very much. So our next question is for Dr. Tadani. And uh, that is a great lecture on, uh, on, on your uh, success uh, in terms of, uh, um, you know, trying to sort of model uh, uh, tracing. So the big question to you is, uh, how is how has testing changed, uh, especially after the onset of vaccination, uh, which is becoming more widespread, especially in the United States, and also the emergence of variants uh, of of the COVID nineteen virus. Thanks, Jay, and uh, it's an honor to be, of course, with uh, Fred and Adira and yourself here this morning. You know, testing um, has undergone uh, quite a bit of evolution, I would say, but not surprisingly. Uh, it, it, we go back and ask and remind ourselves, right? It was um, testing that helped us figure out who was positive, who to treat, who responded to treatments, who to put in trials. Um, it was, you know, the sort of foundation. 
Uh, what's changed, just as you said, is um, early on we were interested in who was positive and, and now especially we're asking who's negative. Um, and this is relevant, especially as we think about the, the variants. When we think about who's negative, of course, it opens up, right? Who can get on a plane potentially, who can go back to school, who can go to a restaurant. Um, the variants, um, many of you know, are sort of the three major ones, but not surprisingly, or we should not be surprised if more, more come. The, the current assays that most people are familiar with by the standard platform um, companies, uh, whether they be Roche, Thermo Fisher, um, Biofire, and so forth, they all use these probes for PCR. And the probes um, are specifically targeted to various gene segments of, of, the, uh, of the virus. Um, the good news is that most of the platforms that we have today uh, aren't directed at any of the gene segments that have been mutated as part of the variants, um, notably the, the South African and the Brazilian one. The platform that we use here, we have many platforms, but one of them we use here is the Thermo Fisher platform. And among the probes in that platform, one of the probes targets the spike protein gene, which unfortunately happens to be the area where there's a deletion for the UK variant. And that's the platform that gives us false negatives, potentially. Uh, so when we see one of the three probes giving us a negative and the other two probes in that assay positive, we then go on and use another platform. But the good news is most of the other platforms can detect um, you know, the, the variants. Um, and uh, you know, the, the second, of course, question in, in all of this is in the context of vaccine, Right, what are we actually doing? And the consensus here, at least among, interestingly enough, the hospitals as well as the universities and colleges in, in Massachusetts are that even in the context of vaccine, we don't expect one, everybody to be vaccinated. Number two, we still have an R naught that's not low just because of the variants. And so what we're doing is actually probably leaning towards routine testing that would continue probably weekly uh, even in the context of vaccine, again, admitting that not everybody is vaccinated and not and the R not is is not low, um, and as schools begin to open, as people begin to come back to work, um, what I'm hearing at least today is um, testing will continue at least weekly to some extent, even among vaccinated individuals. And you know, Al Bickersler gave a great talk yesterday on sort of the response of vaccines to immunocompromised individuals like dialysis patients and highlighted that there are breakthroughs um, among even dialysis patients, not surprisingly. And so it, it, it makes even the issue of testing um, incredibly important for the population that, that we all deal with. Thank you. And, and there's a, a related question from one of the audience members. Uh, who's asking, do you see value in SARS-CoV-2 antibody testing in clinical practice? Yeah, that's a great question. So we provide the serology testing here. And um, you know what we're, struck, what we're stuck with, I should say, is not knowing exactly how long antibodies are positive after natural infection and also after vaccine. We know after vaccine, they probably last a little bit longer. We're using the serology test to look at efficacy of vaccine. We've done it certainly in our trials and many people have done it. But even in the absence of a positive serology test, we don't know what that means because the antibodies wane. It doesn't mean you're susceptible to infection. It's just that it's not detectable given the lower threshold. So um, early on in the pandemic, we used serology routinely, especially look, uh, to, to see who those individuals were who might've been infected. We are slowing down the use of routine serology testing um, um, because, again, two reasons. One, we don't know how long it lasts. And two, even in the absence of serology positive rates, we don't know what that means in terms of likelihood of, of getting infected again. Thank you. So, Dr. Levin, uh, the idea is here, you know, you, you give a wonderful talk on, on, on the challenges um, of CKD and ESRT. So, one question is, what can we do better as a global community in terms of these mega trials that have happened so so routinely in cardiology, but has really left nephrology, you know, behind. So, what are your comments on, you know, trying to sort of come together as a community? Well, thanks, um, Jay, and again, uh, echoing Ravi's uh, really pleasure to be here with uh, colleagues and friends. You know, I think we're at a, a pivotal point in nephrology. We finally have um, both um, new molecules and new approaches, as well as 
and I guess as a side effect of the pandemic, perhaps a new ability to work together, um, both across Zoom and time zones and, and things and, and consenting patients to large trials without having to bring everybody in to see them physically is a possibility. The use of smartphones and other ways to enroll people into trials has already been done in lower middle income countries. So perhaps one of the things that you know, will help us in terms of testing and understanding best therapies is our renewed interest as a global community in helping each other help patients. And uh, I, I have felt over the last three to five years and perhaps more profoundly in the last year, um, that real commitment on the part of the nephrology community to work together. Um, and so those collaborations I think are forming. Uh, I think patients very much want to be involved in studies to understand how better to take care of them. I think that's a change. Um, so, um, and it doesn't mean that it's gonna be perfect, but I think if we can, uh, and Ravi and I were chatting earlier, but and if we can ask the big questions and design studies that aren't super complicated that we can get people into and answer them, um, we'll do better. The SGLT2s are a great example. Like, look, what, look how far we've come uh, in terms of disease-modifying therapies. Um, you know, 6,000 people, 10,000 people in a trial. That's unheard of in nephrology. I completely agree. And uh, let's, let's all keep our fingers crossed that we will launch into a mega trial phase of a, you know, sort of a practice. So and large, this... platform trials, and large platform trials. Like, there's lots of things that we can do okay. differently. Excellent, thank you. So uh, this goes back to Dr. Finkelstein. Um, there's, there was a question from an audience member, um, uh, Dr. Weblinger. How do you explain the higher number of PD patients in a cycler compared to other countries? Is this based on education or is this something that drives uh, the, the widespread use of cyclers in this country? Well, I think one thing that distinguishes PD in the US from almost every other country in the world is the obsession with KT of E measurements. And particularly with CMS uh, giving financial penalties to facilities that don't achieve so-called um, adequate standards of KTV, which is a KTV of over 1.7. The truth is there's very little data that supports that target. There are real fallacies with the whole measurement of KTV, the estimation of V as being one example. Um, um, where It's an estimate. It's not an absolute measurement of what the volume is. It's a serious flaw in the measurements of KT of V. But most other countries in the world focus more on patient reported outcome measures and the patient experience, whereas we focus on laboratory values, hemoglobins and KT with it. So patients start on PD, their body size in the US is frequently higher than they may be in other less developed countries. And you decide that we'll only achieve an adequate KTV by putting someone in a cycle and using large volumes of dialysis solution rather than dealing with the individual patient. What is best for that individual patient? And building an incremental PD, where you start with two, three exchanges a day, PD five days a week, four days a week, to make the patient feel better, relieve you of hemic symptoms, rather than simply obsessing over what we need to do to achieve some arbitrary KTV measurement. So I think that needs to be explored more. What, is, what do the patients really want and what enables them to achieve an adequate clinical income? How many of these patients need to be on cyclers? How many can be managed with incremental PD and a limited number of manual exchanges? Thank you. And uh, Dr. Weblinger has another question. Uh, why are the guidelines not emphasizing more the understanding of the perineal transport type to guide clinicians in dwell time in PD mode? Well, I, I think they do. If you look at the guidelines carefully, I mean, volume status is critically important for the management of all patients with chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease. Um, you know, and the routine use of, of, of PET testing, for example, looking at transport status informs you of how the PD can best be applied. You know, whether the test should be done routinely every three months, every six months, only if patients are having problems with volume management. That's not clear, really. I think that can be left up to the individual facility to decide. Thank you. So, so Ravi, back to you. Um, there was a question about uh, 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 cellular immunity versus antibody testing. So there may be a dissociation. Do you think 
Uh, we are in the uh, era of uh, testing for uh, cellular immunity in, patient, in such patients and whether this will guide uh, you know, uh, a future risk for uh, acquiring the COVID-19 situ- you know, s- uh, status. Yeah, thanks, Jay. It's uh, uh, a, a common question and, and an important one. Um, I think everyone acknowledges that the uh, antibody response and the cellular immunity response are important both in combination to protect and prevent uh, serious disease. Um, I don't know the answer to the question. I don't know to what extent um, cellular immunity is, especially in dialysis patients or patients with CKD, is going to be adequate. What we do know is, right, the efficacy of the vaccine in the population. But I think time will tell in terms of whether the populations that we care for have um, appropriate and adequate um, cellular immunity. I know there have been some studies, and I think I'll uh, Ikezler again reviewed some of them even yesterday uh, that suggest that there may be uh, challenges in, in that particular space. Not surprisingly, like all vaccines, right, the, the uh, B cell and the T cell response are going to be critical. Uh, but I'm curious if, if Fred and, and Adira have any thoughts on this, because I think this is uh, one we're going to learn a lot from. I mean, we have some experiences, you know, with the flu vaccine, but I'm curious if Adira or Fred have any thoughts on this. I mean, if you I think this is an area that another example of what, what we really need to learn um, from like large global studies with different ethnicities, exposure rates, background infection rates, and vaccination rates. And like, let's look and see by GFR and by lev- by type of dialysis, what are the, the, the various responses, both sort of in a test situation and then with respect to response to um, challenges of the viruses. So I think it's a super exciting area. We may learn a lot about immunity as it, as res- with respect to tolerance of, or like there's so much that we can learn if we yeah. think about this. I think it's quite an exciting thing, but I, I don't know, as you said, anything more than, than that we don't know what we don't know. I'll remind everybody that, you know, that when we, we were doing hepatitis vaccine, about 67% of people get a response, and that means that 33% don't, and yet we don't have rampant hepatitis B in our in our dialysis units, right? So maybe you don't need the antibody response, or maybe you need a large background exposure, or maybe um, we just need to understand better what all these different amplitude and duration of antibody responses actually mean in our group. Yeah. Thank well, you. I agree with everything Adira said, but Adira, the routine care would be to give booster shots of hepatitis vaccines for people when their antibody levels disappear, right. not right. wanting to run the risk of perhaps having an outbreak of hepatitis B in the facility. But I'd like to second what Adira said. I think this needs to be thought of globally. And this having studies done in many countries cross-culturally is critically important. Thank you, Fred. And I have, pers- in, you know, being a sort of editor of Kidney International, we have I've had access to a number of articles yeah. showing the dismal rate of uh, positivity in terms of spike antibodies, uh, not only in, the, in, in transplant patients where it's kind of expected, but in, in hemodialysis patients. So, uh, Ravi, any, any strategies that are being planned for the future for this unfortunate group? Because we told them two vaccines, you're all set, you'll be fine. And now we've, we've realized that a majority of <laughs> transplants and many dialysis patients are not going to be protected, at least per spike antibody titers. Right. So there's two ways to address that. One is to hope that everyone around these individuals gets vaccinated so that we can enjoy at least some bit of herd immunity. And two is that um, just as Fred and Adira pointed to, I think everyone is leaning now towards booster shots um, coming up in the near future uh, to a theater near to a theater near you, um, uh, we're, we're talking about that here, even among non-compromised yes. uh, individuals, and and that just may be the the standard way we proceed, not only to you know retain protection, but also to protect against the variants. Thank you. So uh, the the other question, uh, since you're on uh, Ravi, is uh, you know when, when you have a a, a person who's positive, right, uh, who's tested positive RT-PCR. Um, what is the success of contact tracing and isolation been generally in the U.S.? How successful, because that strategy is really what we need. And, uh, you know, it's not clear how effective it's been and are people actually doing this? Yeah, it's a good question. I think the, the answer to that, unfortunately, is it's been a dismal failure. 
um, we have not even as a system and uh, and I'm, I'd be curious again from from your perspective, Jay, in New York and Adir in in, uh, in Canada and and Fred um, in Connecticut, right? We we've tried so hard to to put resources to contact tracing, to put resources into calling people, communicating through cell phones. We just weren't ready and have not been ready as a system, unlike other countries in Asia and, and, and the like that we know of. So it, it has not helped us. I mean, I shouldn't say it's not helped us. We have not been successful in implementing what otherwise has been shown in public health emergencies to be an incredibly effective tool. Yeah, it was the same experience in New York, and, and, and it went both ways. There was a lack of a supply side because of uh, not enough people were available to go knocking on doors. And from the uh, from the other side, people would just refuse, saying it's, you know, I don't want to be part of this, right? So right. It, it is awful. I mean, I got to say, it, it could have been better, but we did not succeed. You're absolutely right. And, and I'm sorry, just Jay, to say that as a result of that, it just means all our only blunt instrument, or maybe not so blunt, is testing, because we, we can't really do much else other than distancing masks and and testing because our failure in those other areas means we have to spend money on the other end. Yeah, this is true. And and I, on that note, uh, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, you know trying to sort of be more efficient using pooled testing you know strategies? What what is pooled testing and how do you see this uh, evolving or you know as being established as a standard of care? Yeah, good question. So uh, you know for two reasons: one, cost, and two, sort of speed. Um, many universities I know in, in Massachusetts um, are moving towards pool testing and actually have been doing pool testing. There's been some recent publication in this area. So the concept is you take a larger tube and you get a nasal swab in three, five or 10 individuals and you put them in the same tube. And then um, you either mix the, the swabs in a sim simple media or you have a media already in there and test that. That actually turns out to be probably the way we're going to be moving forward in the fall, especially among universities here. It turns out the FDA came out with guidance on this matter on Tuesday, just a few days ago, um, providing provided that you have an EUA approved test that and demonstrate val uh, validation and pool testing, again, three, five or 10 samples. That's gonna be an incredibly powerful tool and actually in, in Massachusetts, again, in, in, in the school settings, especially, uh, that's the direction. If a single test costs $25, the pool test is one tenth. If you can put 10 tubes, or sorry, 10 swabs in a tube, so the cost comes down. The problem, and I'll stop after this with the pool testing, is the false negative rate. You lose a little bit of sensitivity with it, but it's worth it um, given the cost, and you don't lose that much, but you do lose some. Thank you. So uh, I know Adira has to leave a little in, a, in, a, in a few moments, uh, but Adira, can you uh, tell us what's been going on with the, uh, the global response to COVID-19 in the nephrology community? Because you, you have a finger on the pulse and you know, you're the best person to tell us what's going yeah, on. The best, I think, you know, we've been, I just got an email from someone in Mexico. People are struggling, right? Depending on where you are and where your resources are. I mean, in Canada, even across this country with its diversity, We've been incredibly lucky sort of in on the West Coast with, uh, although we're having a surge at the moment that has not disproportionately affected dialysis units nor our abilities, whereas in Ontario and Quebec, it has completely overwhelmed them. Um, in different parts of the world, um, there is either no dialysis or rationing going on. Um, our colleagues in India, as you well know, are completely overwhelmed this week with over 200 and or 300,000 cases per day, um, access to transplantation, access to dialysis care around the world has been significantly impacted. And the knock-on effect of the pandemic when the world shut down, the lack of ability to make fistulas, preemptive transplants, properly assess and teach people. Like this is, we will see this knock-on effect in, in both developing and developed worlds, I think, another three years at the very least. I think this is not over yet. Um, and there was a question in the chat about ESKD patients increasing. You know, we have all this modeling going on about what happens if you put in preventative medicines for diabetes and hypertension. We all know that AKI actually contributes to long-term CKD. We have no idea what's going to happen with, you know, all the people that have proteinuria and hematuria with or without a rising creatinine as a consequence of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Now what's gonna happen 
you know, in three, five years in people who have additional comorbidities? Is that an amplifier of risk? There's a lot to, I mean, it, it can be quite frightening, but we could actually embrace this, you know, sort of per, circling back to the talk, as an opportunity to learn together in a true learning health system globally so that we can actually, like, predict it. There was in the UK House of Lords, there was a question very early on in the pandemic, tell, me, tell us what you think will be the knock-on effect with respect to chronic kidney disease, chronic lung disease, and cardiac disease as a consequence of severe infection with COVID-19. I think that's a question, once we get out of this pandemic, or the acute thing, we really do need to think about. I mean, I'd be very interested in Ravi and Fred's thoughts as well, but I, I think this is potentially you know, a massive um, insult to the, to the human condition that actually has a lot of end organ effects that are very directly relevant to our specialty. Thank you. And, you know, in our own uh, experience, which you published a, a few a month ago, uh, so the risk of dying was obviously very high. Uh, when you experience AKI from uh, COVID, it's about 50%. And of the survivors, uh, about 20% left the hospital on RRT. So uh, these patients need to be followed out of their recovery, but clearly there's a CKD, AKI on CKD or AKD uh, phase of this disease that needs to be you know, further described. And it's not just, a, you know, hey, you've, you've recovered and your kidneys are going to recover, but you're absolutely right. This is, this is going to be a problem. And, and we're seeing this in the lungs as well. We have, we've heard about the first lung transplant after a prolonged uh, you know, intubation in a patient with uh, COVID-19 pneumonia. So yes, the scarring. I've seen. Sorry, just want to. I mean, because I'm working with some of my respirology colleagues. I mean, some of the images, three and six months post acute infection, even if they were not intubated, is quite profound. And if the scarring is in the lungs, the scarring is in the kidneys. <laughs> like, I, I, don't, I completely agree. Yeah. But certainly, um, the incidence of AKI in hospitalized patients with COVID is extraordinarily high. Right, which I think everyone's experiences, and even the ones not requiring dialysis, I think as Adira alluded to, I mean, the implications of that for chronic kidney disease in the future really need to be carefully monitored. I think it's gonna be very substantial. Can I ask actually as a follow-up, I, um, I get the sense here, at least in our system, that the requirement for RRT, at least the immediate requirement, with AKI slightly lower than it was earlier on. That doesn't mean the long-term consequences have gone away, but I'm just curious, are we still seeing that same incidence in terms of RRT requirement with AKI? So, Go ahead, Jay. Yeah, I can say New York, you know, we, we, we just, uh, we analyzed the data just very recently. And uh, it, it used to be that if you're in an ICU, your AKI rate 70%. And if you are not in a, a non-ICU patient, it's over 28%. And recently, we just reanalyzed the data, and, and the ICQ is about less than 10%. And uh, it's vanishingly low in, in, in the non-ICU patients. And uh, I, I'm not clear why this is so. It may be that we're using remdesivir and dexamethasone very early on, or, or patients are getting the antibody cocktail before coming into the hospital. But clearly, there's been a change in the uh, biology of, uh, of renal disease from uh, 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 from COVID-19 in the last several months, and which is a good thing for us, but uh, clearly the uh, it's not going to go away completely anytime soon. Adira, uh, you, you're saying? Uh, I was going to say, I mean, I think that what I was impressed with was some earlier publications about even in the absence of a bump in creatinine, the, um, the incidence of hematuria and proteinuria is quite high. And I just wonder how well we're screening for that in the, and I, I just wonder if, again, this is one of those things that we will learn if we systematically standardize the testing of everybody and it's not random. So is everyone getting a urinalysis and a urine ACR when they get COVID positivity? I doubt it. And if they did, perhaps we could learn more because I think it's more than just the you know, standard definition of AKI that we need to also be mindful of. Great. And I think uh, um, that's about the time we have. There are no other questions from the audience. And I'd like to thank the, thank all of you for being here to answer questions. And uh, thank you, audience members, for coming. And don't forget to look at the posters and the uh, exhibitor booths after you leave our session. And, uh, and please do enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.